I shall not tell you what. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but later today I'm going to be grown out. <laughs> Man, I'm so blessed to be here, aren't we? Amen. Aren't we all just so blessed to be here? Can I get a big praise God? Praise God. Now, we're going to be talking about something that over the next several weeks that we hear but we don't often think deeply enough about, and that's deliverance. Now, I'm sure that many of us, if not all of us, at some point in time have ordered something online, right? We placed an order, whether it's Amazon, Walmart, we've placed an order online at some point in time. And so when we do that, we have a certain expectation. We see it says, we'll be delivered on this date, so we expect it to be there on that day. Am I correct? So generally, this, this goes exactly how it's supposed to go. You order it, it's supposed to be there Tuesday, and you get it on Tuesday, you're happy, you're excited, but happy to sit on your doorstep. But there are those moments and there are those times where, well, let's be honest, things don't go exactly as planned. It's supposed to be there on Tuesday, but it gets there on Friday. Or you ordered one thing and you got another thing, right? Or how many times have you come home and you've got a box that's this big stuck between your storm door and your entry door? Like, that's the right place to put it. I actually was looking at some pictures online not that long ago of the craziest places that UPS and FedEx packages have been placed. In trees? Can you believe it? In a tree? I've seen them placed behind bushes? Over the, just chucked over the fence? So things can go wrong when something is being delivered. And let's be real honest, this is a stressful situation, especially if it's a, an important gift or, or something for a loved one or it's Christmas time or, or somebody's birthday. And when this doesn't go in the manner that we want it to go, we become very distraught and stressed and upset. But very often, we immediately, and I do mean immediately, start pointing fingers at the delivery guy who has no control over it, right? Or at the company, very rarely do we take a look at ourselves and say, well, did I order that this way? Or did I set up a different delivery date? Did I read that delivery date correctly? Did I give them the correct information? Delivery instructions. Maybe, maybe not. But our instinct is to say this delivery was not delivered the way I wanted it delivered. And many things can go wrong, like I said, in this process. So many problems can occur. But there was a study done, or a poll done not that long ago, that says nearly one in five, that's 18%, said their delivery uh, never arrived or arrived in place. While one in 10, 11%, said they did not receive their delivery in time for Christmas. Now, I'm willing to bet that the one in five and the one in 10 immediately blame either the delivery company, the manufacturer, or the, the website, whether it's Amazon or whatnot. So when it comes to our expectations, we require this certain level of accuracy and accountability on the part of the company or the delivery service. And we lack that same accountability from ourselves. Now, what if deliveries, what if these deliveries were based on our morality. What if the delivery was based on our morality, our spirituality? Now hear me out here. We are awful quick at times to assume the delivery problem lies entirely on the driver's shoulders. That's the number one person, according to polls, that is blamed when a delivery doesn't go as it's supposed to go. And only one in 50 actually blame themselves for making a mistake in the, in the form or whatever was used to order. So instead of looking at the form or the information, they instead lash out. They jump to conclusions. They point fingers. They pass judgment instantaneously. Now this causes a tumultuous relationship between you, the delivery guy, you, and the company. Bad reviews. If you look at most reviews that are one star, it's one tiny little thing that creates that one star despite how many good things there are. So why is that? Why do we recognize why do we not recognize our shortcomings, but everybody else's? Why do we see Calvin fixing things? Why do we double check and triple check? There's an old carpenter's adage, measure twice, cut once. 
But we don't do that most of the time. We're so quick to get that order in, whether it's on our smartphone or it's on our laptop. We're just so quick to get that in. Oh, that's perfect for so-and-so. That's perfect for so-and-so. That'd make a great Christmas present. But here's the question. What if this was our relationship with God? What if we criticize God and how he delivers us in the same way we do UPS, FedEx, and Amazon? Wouldn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, would it? The greatest delivery ever made in human history. The greatest. But what have we been set free from? What have we been delivered from? So over the next several weeks, we're going to discuss delivery. Right now, I want to lay that foundation. I want to lay the foundation of what is deliverance. The way it is established and the way it was set forth. So as Christians, we have been delivered. Amen? We've been delivered from so many things, countless things. Whether it's drinking, it's drugs, fornication. We have been delivered. And the postage, that postage was paid in full. We didn't have to pay anything. There was no delivery charge for that delivery. Over the next few weeks, like I said, we're going to dig a bit deeper into our deliverance and what that means. So right now, let's lay the foundation. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Romans. We're going to start in verse 1, chapter 8. I'll give you a moment. Therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Setting his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but instead according to the Spirit. For those who are in accord with the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in accordance with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Amen. See, deliverance seems to be a forgotten word today. A forgotten word in the church. We don't really hear that word anymore. We hear plenty of other words and sayings. Sayings like, they need to pray. Or, they need a victory. Or, they need joy in their life. But we neglect the delivery part. Anyone who is a parent here understands the, the biggest part, the most amazing part of a pregnancy is the delivery. Amen? Yeah. That's when your son or your daughter is brought into the world and tears of joy flow. So that delivery is important. So in reality, what people actually need, what we all need, is to be delivered. We need deliverance. Amen? Yeah. Deliverance is a remarkable word, too. It really is when you think about it. And the very sound of it. From a, from a Christian perspective, the very sound of the word to be delivered or deliverance, it stirs the heart and mind. And the meaning of it does as well. From a Christian perspective, it means to be rescued. To be rescued from our punishment. From our sins. Amen? Praise God, right? Praise God. To be delivered from that. Because we know the wages of sin is death. And this isn't just the physical death. This is the spiritual death. Our peace, our joy, and most importantly, our salvation was delivered on time on Mount Calvary. Amen? So despite who we are or who we were, salvation is being delivered every day. And we overlook it. So we just read Romans chapter 8. Now Paul in chapter 7, having spoke in depth, the, in that chapter concerning the struggle and the combat that believers feel within themselves, the apostle opened the true causes and reasons of the grievances and their complaints. But if we look back, if we just kind of look back a little bit, put Romans 8 
in context. 723 says this, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner. Boy, those are some powerful words. He is admitting here that he is a prisoner to himself. That sin is waging a war against his mind as it does all of us. It wages a war against us, and he is now a prisoner. So he needs to be rescued. Amen? He needs to be delivered from them. And he begins chapter 8 with a comfortable account of safety. The safety of believers in Christ Jesus. The deliverance of us as followers of Christ. Paul points to what gives them the greatest uneasiness in, his, in this life in chapter 7. And in this chapter, he proceeds to take notice. To take notice of the very solid ground, the foundation. The foundation of our faith, the foundation of who we are, and the foundation of what Jesus came to do. That they have spiritual peace and joy. And this spiritual peace and joy, they arise from our justification, and more importantly, our adoption into the kingdom. Our release and rescue. There's no happier moment for a stuck hiker when they see that chopper coming down. That rescue chopper with that rope that comes down to save them, to rescue them. And it is in that moment that they understand, that they realize hope is not lost. Their life has not ended. And that's the same for us. When we are rescued from our sins, when we surrender at the cross, when we do as we are commanded, we should have that same feeling of joy. Amen? Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen? Praise God. Amen. Praise God. We are delivered. We are delivered from these desires when we surrender. We are delivered from the flesh, as Paul puts it. The very flesh that Satan uses against us. He uses our own desires against us to convince us that our sin is not a bad thing and that it's okay to walk in the world as the world. Who, who walk not after flesh? That's us. We walk not after flesh, but instead by the cross. By which is meant not the ceremonial law, but the corruption of nature or the corrupt nature of man. Are we a corrupt creation, my brothers and sisters? Are we wretched sinners in need of rescue? Then why do we ignore deliverance as we do? Yeah. See, from this, we have been delivered. We've been delivered on time. Through the Spirit of the Lord, we are delivered. For what the law could not do, Weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. We have been pardoned. We have been released. We have been rescued from the bondage of sin. So what does this all mean? What does this all mean to us as Christians? Does it mean that we continue to walk in sin? Is that what it means? Does it mean that we recognize what has been done. And in our appreciation and our love for what has been done for our rescuer, that we, we instead of living for the flesh, we live for the spirit. Amen? Paul makes it very clear here. There's no if, ands, or buts. If we go back and we look at what Paul says in 723, but I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner. Paul is saying here he needed to be delivered. He needed to be rescued. He needed to be taken from himself and rescued from himself because despite his best efforts, he could never rescue himself. You know, I said just a few minutes ago about one of the greatest moments for a stuck hiker is that helicopter that flies above their head and that rope drops down with that basket on it and those paramedics and those rescue teams, and they come down. Could that hiker do that on their own? Could they pilot the helicopter? Could they man the winch with the rope on it? No. 
Nor can we, in our own doings and in our own way, nor could we rescue ourselves. Therefore, the laws that were under Moses and prior to Jesus could not either. And we need to recognize that. Because there is, therefore, now no condemnation. So over the next several weeks, like I said, we're going to discuss what we've been delivered from. The things we don't recognize we've been delivered from. The things that we still need to be delivered from. Whether it's pornography. Whether it's a, a, a foul mouth. Whether it is alcohol. Whether it is drugs. Whether it is anger. Whether it is despair or fear. Our deliverance comes through Christ Jesus. And the only way we can be delivered is to lean into Christ Jesus. Amen? So what do we do? How, how do we do this? How do we accept that delivery? Do we continue to do what we're doing? Or do we, as Scripture tells us, to turn away from who we were, who we were, and who we might end up being if we continue down that path? Scripture tells us we are a new creation in Christ. So some of the things that we are delivered from are part of our old selves. They are not who we are now. But yet when we get into that flesh, that war is waged upon us through Satan. We become prisoners to ourselves. We become, become prisoners to our sin. Is that where we want to be as Christians? Or do we want to be delivered? Do we, want, do we want to feel that joy we feel when our son or daughter is born in that delivery room? I say we do. I say that we can put behind us the fornication, the drinking, the drugs. Amen? I say that we can put behind us the old thoughts, the sick thoughts, the immoral thoughts, and that we can stand up for what's just and true. Because that delivery is not just for you and I. And we forget that too. That delivery is not just for those of us that have been delivered. Because at one point in time in our lives, we too were not delivered. <laughs> at one point in time in our lives, we too were slaves to immorality. Yeah. At one point in time, we were the lost. Yeah. At one point in time, we did not see the light, but we loved the darkness. And at this time, there are millions upon millions of people that need to be delivered. There are millions upon millions of people that are slaves to their sin. There are millions upon millions of people that surrender to the flesh every day and are miserable. They try to fill that void where Jesus resides. They try to fill that with drugs, with alcohol, with fornication, with everything but Jesus. So as I end this, this initial message, I want you to know over the next several weeks, we are going to dive into this. And we need to utilize these tools. We need to utilize this scripture. We need to utilize the Holy Spirit within us. So that those who have not been delivered might be delivered. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to deliver your word. And as, as we go forward in, in this series, Father, there are so many very uncomfortable things that we're going to discuss. We recognize we've been delivered. But we fail to recognize and are so short-sighted that others need to be delivered. So, Father, I pray that, that you work within us, that you, you give us your spirit, that you speak to us, that you strengthen us, that you encourage us. So that we may show people to that delivery room. That delivery room where your son sat on a cross, Father. So, Father God, I pray these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, as she pans that camera back around.
We've got a wonderful, wonderful thing getting ready to happen. Scripture tells us that there's more rejoicing in heaven when one repentant sinner comes to Christ than 99 righteous men. Amen? Amen. So right now, I'm going to call up Mike and Sheila. They'll step up here with me. And while they step up, I want everybody to bow their heads and say a quick sound prayer as he steps into baptism. First, we want to address uh, something else. Sheila Wilson here has been attending here, I guess, for a little while now. Uh, she's faithful. She's, her daughters are here with us and generally are every Sunday. And through conversation and, and, and I guess, thoughtful prayer, um, Sheila's decided to commit her membership here to Bristol Christian Church. So let's give her a hand and welcome her. <laughs> We're welcoming you. We love you. We're glad you made that decision. Now let's get on to my brother right here. Mike approached me a couple weeks ago and said that he wanted to be baptized. He wanted to take that step. Much like many of us, his, his journey has been wrought with all kinds of speed bumps and walls that we run into, sometimes purposely, if you're anything like me. But he has made the decision to, to, to accept Jesus and be baptized in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you a few questions, Mike. I just need a yes or no from you, okay? okay? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Yes. Do you believe that he was sent to take on the sin of the world on that cross so that we may be rescued from our punishment? Yes. Do you commit today to live your life as a disciple of Christ Jesus and that you will listen to the Spirit as it is placed upon you? Yes. All right, so in that moment, you guys can relax. If you'll go through that door right there, Mike, we're going to get ready. Your numerals I'm playing uh, three thirty with first and last person. <laughs>
I believe in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I told you you were bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, I'm going to call it.